So thanks everybody for sticking around. I know the day has been long already and uh, everybody's tired, but I'm probably the most unlikely person to fall asleep during the talk because I have to keep on speaking. Uh, so I uh, feel for you, but at the same time I don't want to switch perspectives with you. So that is maybe a twisted kind of empathy in itself. Um, but anyhow, let's, let's get to the topic. A phenomenological description of empathy should include an attempt to identify different ways in which another subject can appear as the intentional referen reference point of my empathic act. Empathy arises not only in relation to real embodied human others who we encounter in the life world, but also with fictional persons, for example, literary figures, and with agents we usually don't tend to regard as persons, for example, some animals, also hopefully machines. Thomas Fuchs, in a contribution to a book I had the pleasure to edit, and which you can perhaps also find outside, um, on the limits of empathy, Grenzen der Empathie, uh, from 2013, and for which I am particularly thankful to him, distinguishes three levels of empathy in this respect, namely an implicit bodily one, which is characterized by the inter-effective, intercorporeal coordination of the interaction partners in situations of embodied intersubjectivity. Second, an explicit imaginative one, on which processes of imaginative transposition and conscious simulation are based. And thirdly, a fictional one in which empathy focuses on fictional and non-personal agents. An element of virtuality or fictionality can already be recognized at level two, namely in the as-if consciousness that characterizes the explicative procedures of imagination and transposition, or simulation, as some people prefer to call it. But what is different about fictional empathy, then, Fictional empathy posits the other as non-real, that is, it works with a kind of double bookkeeping. While watching a thrilling love scene in the cinema, for example, you can always be aware that the actors only play their roles and that in real life they don't need to be romantically engaged, or probably are in the most cases not. So, one must be able to change perspectives and keep them apart at the same time. And this demanding ability can, as Thomas Fuchs shows in this contribution, be distributed and disturbed in the most uh, radical sense and even lost in psychopathological modifications of consciousness, but also with increasing virtualization of the life world and social encounters with other people. This leads to an unlimited um, empathy he calls it eine unbegrenzte uh, empathie in which the border between me and the other or between the real and the fictional becomes blurred. With the various ways in which we engage in virtual encounters, the natural limits of empathy that are founded in our embodied synchronizations um, are somehow exceeded which can have potentially neurotic effects on the subject. What is left out or skipped in fictional empathy, as it were, is the resistance of the other, which is founded in her physical presence. Interbodily interaction lives from a dynamic interplay of resonances and dissonances, synchronizations and desynchronizations, which are also, of, of course, non-pathological. I mean, desynchronization isn't necessarily always pathological. That's, that's for certain. Such an oscillation does not exist in fictional empathy in the same way. That is, the other, in that mode of empathic directionality, has no voice of their own um, with which they could influence our own empathic process. So empathy becomes one-sided, projective. Um, or another way to put it is, the empathizer can use his empathy as an omnipotent instrument of his projections, uh, of his attributions. Um, whereby at the same time any independence and foreignness of the other is leveled out. Two symptoms of the virtualization of empathy identified by Thomas Fuchs are the phantomization, removal of the difference between appearance and existence, and secondly, the disembodiment of communication, 
which amounts to a removal of the difference between near and far, of physical presence and absence. As a result of the possibility of being able to quickly and easily switch one's own presence on and off in the interaction, for example in online chats and all kinds of social media, personal relationships are in danger of becoming more shallow and the dwindling resistance is accompanied by a dwindling sensitivity to reality, as Thomas points out. So the experience of the other is only a genuine one if there is some kind of possibility of negativity, of real resistance, of correction by the foreign, a motif that is of course widespread in phenomenology but also in hermeneutics where um, negativity plays a, a big role for the constitution of a genuine understanding, be it in the aesthetic domain but also in the interpersonal domain, uh, in the historical sciences and so forth. So the other is only the other is the only possibility um, for correction of my consciousness because she is the only one who exists beyond and independent of mere for meanness, to express it with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. A differentiation that is worthwhile introducing here is that between neutrality and fictionality, which can be understood as two modes of as if consciousness or as if empathy. What is characteristic of the fictional is that the index of neutrality shifts in the direction of unreality because one knows, for instance, in a novel that one is dealing with an invented story, at least if it's not a historical account that has some uh, claim to historical truth, even though that, that might be um, contended as well. At the same time, the unreal has a life of its own which is inaccessible to the free variation of one's own fantasy consciousness. You cannot choose what the psychological life of a character is like when you read a novel or when you watch a um, film. Literary descriptions always set some limits to the reader's imagination, so that would be a kind of external boundary criterion for your imaginative empathy. With the neutral, that is the purely imaginative, the limits of empathy do not lie in the resistance of the noematic correlate, so the target of, of the empathy, but in the limitation of one's own imagination, and that would then, on the other side, be a, an internal criter boundary criterion, if you want to call it that. The ability, namely, to creatively combine elements of experience to form imaginatory realms. Now a new complexity of intentional analysis or static analysis, we've heard about the difference between static and genetic uh, analysis yesterday, I remain in the static domain for the purpose of this short paper. So now a new complexity of uh, an intentional analysis with regard to the as-if intentionality of empathy becomes obvious. The manifestation of what empathy is directly or indirectly focused at, but also the expressions that can accompany empathy on the part of the empathizer, and be perceived by the target can be marked by the index of reality as well as by the index of neutrality. Noetically real in the sense of an intersubjective access and validation means here that an emotion for instance has an expressive quality that can be perceived by the other. And this is a topic that we've heard about in one of the session talks um, where the resonance principle in interaction and the ways by which impressions are turned into expressions and vice versa in, in the interaction were explained. The expression can to a certain degree be regulated by myself so that I can decide whether I want to deceive others or not or whether I want to express authentically what I feel in a given moment. For example, I can shed a tear to pretend I feel compassion for the audience, let's say, um, although in reality I feel completely indifferent. So this would be a, a case of a noetic on the side of my empathic act lying as if mode of consciousness. The intention to deceive is what gives my emotion its noetic quasi character. If on the other hand the grief of the um, other really concerns me and if I show her a truly meant and really felt pity then this can be called the noet noetic reality character of an emotion. Of course, I can also hide a real emotion so that the natural expression associated with it is suppressed 
and my emotional state remains invisible, as it were, to the other. In this case, the intentional structure of the intersubjective reference is complicated because there is an oasis with the index of reality, in the sense of actually being felt, with which an expression is correlated, which may also be classified as real by the other, but from the viewpoint of an omniscient observer, and also from my own, it possesses the index of virtuality, or quasi-haftigkeit. But isn't my subjective experience always based on an actual, and in this sense, real, that is non-quasi-like emotion, or any other uh, conscious state, volitional state, um, bodily state? That would be the question one uh, would ask here, probably. Here one could claim that one always has some real affective state which would either, in the first case, express in an authentic way um, what one is feeling, which one secondly wishes to conceal and therefore produces an expression that suggests to the other than, that one does not have this particular feeling. So this would be, um, this one could perhaps call a passive deception. Or thirdly, which one tries to conceal because one wants to make the other believe that one has a particular other state of mind. That would be an active deception where one produces an, a particular expression to make the other believe that one has this particular expression while at the same time one has a different one. So, the others should believe that I have an emotion of a more or less arbitrary type only not of the actually given type, that would be the first mode, um, and the second mode I want to make them believe that I have an emotion of type X and no other type. As these considerations show, in empathy there are not only differences in the noematic appearance of real or fictional others, so the targets of my empathic acts, uh, the interlocutors or the interactants with, with whom I engage, but also on the noetic side, in the real or quasi-empathic acts themselves. So um, the noetic noematic correlation can be used as a little tool to investigate further descriptively the intentional structures um, that play a role here in empathy. I can also modulate the feelings and expressions of empathy towards the other, so the expressions of empathy themselves, not just more fundamental uh, emotions that enter into the um, dyadic or otherwise more complex interaction. My empathy can be real in the sense of, sense of truly felt and honestly displayed, but I can just as well try to hide my actual, possibly indifferent or even antipathic attitude and feelings towards the other. In these cases there is a combination of a quasi-like noesis with the real noema, namely the other being the real noema, uh, and not a fictional one like a literary figure. One question that follows now is, how can I experience a quasi-like emotional state at all in hypocrisy or deception? The virtuality refers only to the expression that I modulate with an intention directed at the other, but not to the preceding emotion that is to be disguised. So, a quasi-like emotion or a quasi-like noesis in general would be a nonsense since I cannot deceive myself that I have this or that feeling, this or that act, which always possesses an undeniable first personal quality of mindness. A term with which Sartre, again, attempts to approach this paradoxical self-relation is that of bad faith, or mauvaise foi, which consists in lying to oneself in a particular way. What is the difference between the intersubjective process of deception that I've described before and Sartre's particular kind of self-deception? And here is a little quote that illustrates the point he tries to make. The one who practices bad faith is hiding a displeasing truth or presenting a truth as pleasing untruth. Bad faith then has in appearance the structure of falsehood. Only what changes everything is the fact that in bad faith it is from myself that I am hiding the truth. Thus the duality of the deceiver and the deceived does not exist here. Bad faith, on the contrary, implies in essence the unity of a single consciousness. And this personal union makes the phenomenon of bad faith paradoxical, since as a deceiver I must know the truth that is hidden from me as a deceived thing. So again, a noetic, noematic paradox, if you will. So here is, of course, um, not the place to evaluate in which mental states, 
the Sartrean description is accurate. Um, it would be the, the task for a psychopathological investigation to find concrete articulations of bad faith in specific disorders. What I simply wanted to demonstrate with the uh, conceptual differentiations above, so with these ones, um, namely the categories of indexicality, neutrality, virtuality, and fictionality as developed and interpreted by our host of the conference are useful guidelines for the analysis of empathy in its various forms. What I still haven't spelled out and only allude to in the, uh, in the conclusion is how imagination actually operates in empathic experience. A paper about this will hopefully come out soon, so I don't want to spoil too much. Just that a combination of perceptual and social perspectives with a differentiation in three forms of phantasmatic or imaginatory consciousness seems useful. And there are these, these three levels, one could say, of um, firstly, phantasmatic self-affection, um, where Dieter Loma describes, according to Husserl, how there is a particular function of weak fantasy in perception, and if there is a level of empathy that operates on basically on perception, direct social perception approaches, if you think about those phenomenological interventions in, in social cognition research. So if there is an important function of perception for empathy, namely in understanding bodily expressions, and if there is a particular function of phantasmatic self-affection in perception, then we should also take into account uh, this function of weak fantasy for imagination. And how could that work? I mean, think of the um, well-known example of being at a fair or at an amusement park, and from afar you see um, a kinetic automaton waving at you. And first you think it's a human being, and the movement of the arm seems to be very inviting and very... Um, at least not abrupt or not mechanical or not machine-like. And then you approach the, the figure and you realize that, oh, it's actually just a machine. And then all of a sudden the movement of the arm seems very abstruse or, or, or absurdly mechanical. And the argument here would be um, that in perception there are constantly phantasmata or phantasmagoric surplus produced that uh, according to the habitualized types, perceptual types that you've stored in your memory or wherever, um, they enhance or they strengthen the assumptions that you already have concerning how a certain appearance will appear to you and, and maintain to appear to you. So if you have the, the type human activated in your mind, then the function of phantasmatic self-affection will be to enforce the appearance of a human. Uh, and if you have the type machine or kinetic automaton activated, the function will be to make it uh, even more, look even more mechanical. So here one could of course ask, why should we call this fantasy or imagination? Isn't it part of perception that we should find a different terminology for perhaps? But at least if we want to follow Dieter Loma, uh, he calls this phantasmatic self-affection. Um, the, the second level would be perceptual fantasy or spatial transposition to the place of the other to figure out what a situation would look like from somebody else's perspective. So I'm down here, you're up there. For you the room will look rather different and then the question is, is it, a, is it an achievement of empathy that I transpose myself into any of your spatial positions to then figure out how the room would look like or is this not yet empathy because it has nothing to do with you as a person with um, individual internal states or psychological experiences? It would simply be, um, I could do it even without you being present, I could try to imagine how it would be like from that particular position even without any subject being there or the act being directed towards. Anyway, you could figure out by mental rotation or by phantasmatic transposition in space how something would be looking like from another perspective. And then finally, the most uh, demanding, of course, modality would be personal imagination or perspective taking, um, role taking, taking the, trying to take the social role of another person. You have to know a lot about their personal background, autobiographic background, potentially the kinds of experience they might have made, uh, situational clues, uh, 
uh, and general knowledge that you activate to figure out how it is like to experience something not only from a spatial perspective, obviously, or from a perceptual perspective, but how, it is, how is it like actually being that other person with all their habits and individual personality. So, um, and here imagination obviously plays a big role because if you don't know the person all that well, you will have to engage additional um, imaginatory resources to try to figure this out and the, the kind of background knowledge that you, that you use in this process is of course very different uh, across individuals and um, so there is always this paradox of the background in empathy when, when personal empathy is concerned and not, not only these, these spatial perceptual kinds of transpositions because the question is I mean Peter Goldie and Jan Slaby and many other people have pointed to the problem of making to you as an empathizer the background experiences and the personal background, the, the identity um, and the um, everything that can be called background um, into an objectifiable and, and maybe measurable or at least something that, is, that you, can, you can relate to your own experience in a particular way that is meaningful to you and that you can then attribute something back to the other. That this is a paradox, that the background as background, qua being background, cannot be made into foreground um, if you um, don't, if you so it can only be made into foreground and objectifiable and introspectable and so on if you distort it, if you rob it of its, uh, of its horizonality as being a background. So that's the most, um, the most demanding challenge for empathy. But then the question for the whole approach would be how narrow or why do we want to make the notion of phantasmatic consciousness or imaginatory consciousness imagination and how do these different levels um, of imagination, if we want to call it that, interact or influence the different levels of, um, of empathy. And Thomas Fuchs has uh, made very useful distinctions concerning the levels of empathy and now the second step would be, okay, can we find a function for imagination on all these levels? So I hope we can talk about that further. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>